This uh, lecture will cover the four on Paul's letters. So we will talk about authorship, the form of Paul's letters, the nature of delivery of Paul's letters, and the collection of Paul's letters. So to begin with, uh, probably the thing that causes the most anxiety when it comes to studying Paul um, is the question of authorship. And so there are some problems with thinking about Pauline authorship. If you'll remember that Rembrandt painting, Paul alone, sort of darkly lit uh, with only a candle, pouring over the scriptures, writing down his letters. Um, that is sort of our, our modern concept of Paul, the genius, the, the solitary genius. But it doesn't really fit, it doesn't mesh with what Paul says about his letter. And so in Romans 16, 22, it is clear that Paul is using a secretary. More likely than not, that means Paul is dictating his letter to someone else and that someone else is writing the letter down to him. In other letters, uh, Paul only seems to mention that he's signing at the end, uh, right? He, he says in Galatians, see with what big letters I am writing my own name. Um, again, giving the suggestion that Paul didn't himself write these letters, but he's sort of signing off on them. In addition to this, um, at the beginnings of his letters, he co-sends or co-writes most of his letters. So again, this idea of Paul in a room all by himself just doesn't fit with the evidence. Most of these letters are written by Paul and somebody else. And so here are some of the co-writers that Paul mentions in his letters. Um, Sosthenes uh, was the co-writer of 1 Corinthians. Timothy is the co-writer of 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. Uh, in Galatians, he identifies all the members of God's family who are with me as his co-authors. And then uh, Salve Silvanus and Timothy are also co-authors or co-writers with Paul in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And so when we think about authorship, it's, it's best for us to think that they were likely dictated to a secretary and that they were the result of communal activity. In addition to sort of just that general sort of the evidence from the letters, we have uh, what, what scholars have identified as the disputed and the undisputed letters of Paul. And so be, believe it or not, the first disputed letter of Paul is actually Hebrews. There are many canon lists that give Hebrews as the 14th letter of Paul. And so this is the first disputed letter of Paul. In modern scholarship, there are seven undisputed letters. These are, these are letters that uh, the broad scholarly consensus think were authored or authorized by Paul. Um, these are Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. And to these, then, we would add the six, quote, disputed letters. These are the letters that scholars dis dispute the authorship of Paul. The ones that, are, that have the least amount of controversy would be 2 Thessalonians and Colossians. Ephesians is fairly widely regarded as a non-Pauline letter that sort of was, was intended to introduce the whole Pauline corpus. And then the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, have sort of been treated as a group and distinguished as non-Pauline uh, for a number of reasons, as we'll explore later in the class. Uh, basically, the criteria for determining whether or not a letter was actually written by Paul um, uh, is, is made by criteria related to style, like the writing style, the vocabulary used, the content, um, the, the, the issues being covered in the letter, and then finally, the chronology, sort of any details that we can, we can read behind the text to see whether or not those would fit uh, Paul's lifetime, or if they sort of reflect a life setting that is, is later than Paul, maybe early uh, second century or late first century. Now, the real problem with this is that there is an assumed center to Paul's thought and Paul's theology, and you can sort of measure all of the letters against that center. But it's just important for us to recognize that there's a circularity to this, right? That you've already identified which letters will provide the criteria for evaluating the other letters. There is one possible solution, um, and this is uh, what Luke Timothy Johnson argues, is that Paul authored or authorized all 13 letters, but not, did not necessarily write 
all 13 letters. And so he sees uh, a Pauline school sort of originating in the lifetime of Paul, that Paul sort of authorized um, these writings, but maybe did not write them all. The second thing to cover about the Paul's letters, the nature of Paul's letters, is their form. And so Paul's letters follow a pretty consistent four-part structure. And so first, there is a greeting. Next, most of these letters are going to have a prayer. Um, and this prayer anticipates the themes of the letter. It often introduces or sort of gets the hearer ready to experience those larger themes. Then there is the body of the letter, sort of the meat of the letter. Finally, there is the final greeting or farewell. The next uh, thing to talk about Paul's letters concerns their delivery. And just as we talked about letters in general in antiquity, they served as a substitute for Paul's physical presence. So when Paul was in prison or when Paul was in another region, he couldn't physically be present with these congregations. He sent letters as his replacement to be his physical presence. Often these letters were delivered by delegates of Paul. So these were people who were familiar with the letters of Paul. This is not an anonymous postman, in other words, but uh, they are associates of Paul who might have had a, a major role in helping interpret or apply the letter to those congregations that they were being sent to. We know from a number of these letters that they were intended to be read aloud in the assembly. Um, they were to be communally experienced, not poured over by individuals in dark rooms, but reflected upon and read together in a gathered assembly. There is evidence, at least from Colossians, that these letters may have been circulated among several assemblies and that they might have been exchanged. And as mentioned earlier, um, these letters that are delivered are occasional. They are responding and addressing specific communities and issues. And so what we would think about with regards to delivery and presence is that these letters are delivering theology that is worked out in practice. It's worked out in conversation and it's worked out in reflection. And Joette Basler in her introduction to Paul puts it this way. I'm not at all certain that Paul had a theology that is a reasonably well-ordered and integrated set of beliefs. Even if he did, I am not convinced that it would have remained constant over the course of his tumultuous life, or that we could hope to recover it from the few and focused letters that remain of his correspondence. Clearly, though, Paul did practice theology. That is, he thought through the problems afflicting his churches in light of the gospel. And I think that notion of Paul practicing theology and understanding his letters as part of that practice of theology, part of him helping communities practice theology as they reflected on the gospel and reflected their problems and their experiences through the gospel is really important. We also want to talk about the collection of Paul's letters. There is a good sort of um, speculation uh, that the collection of Paul's letters began actually in his lifetime. So even before he died, there may have been something like a collection of Paul's letters. Um, we know that other authors, uh, other letter writers from antiquity, preserved copies of their letters. Um, and so they might have a scribe write two copies of their letter so that they could keep one for themselves just in case there was a, a response coming back to them, right? Um, that said, uh, you said in your letter this and that and the other, but we don't understand. It. And so the ability to sort of have a copy saved would be important for this uh, correspondence via letters. It's also um, uh, quite likely that Paul's delegates and associates saved his letters, that they preserved those letters. Um, in, in a letter like 1 Corinthians, he's giving them some tangible teaching. He's helping them uh, make sense of, of spiritual gifts and of food sacrifice to idols and so forth. And so there might be a need to save these letters even while Paul is still alive. And this practice of collecting and saving uh, the letters of Paul most likely continued, actually most certainly continued after he died. Um, and so early in the second century, we begin to see manuscripts of the Pauline corpus. We have, we have manuscripts that have most or all of the letters of Paul. And so some of them are 10 letters. They're letters to the churches plus, plus Philemon. Uh, so that would not include the pastoral letters, right? 
Uh, then we have uh, a 13 letter corpus, which is what we now know what is in our sort of New Testament as we have it. And then there were also um, uh, collections that had 14 letters to Paul, right? Because Hebrews has now been included as a Pauline letter. And we see uh, in the New Testament, uh, probably our earliest recollection of this collection process um, in Second Peter 3, 15 through 16, that says, so also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all of his letters. So the author of Second Peter is certainly aware of Paul, the letter writer, and is more likely than not certain of, uh, aware of the collected collection of his letters so that um, people are able to make use of them. That brings our lecture on the four on Paul's letters to a completion. Thank you for your attention.